Guys? Bill Simberg, how are you? I'm going to do the commentary today. Anything in particular you'd like me to say about you in the introduction? You won Cyprus. Yeah. And you're just a top nice guy. Okay, good luck. All right. You're from London? Bristol. Okay. <laughs> Am I live? Okay. Okay, I welcome everybody. I understand we're now live from <coughs> Monte Carlo. I'm Phil Simborg, uh, co-partner of the Backgammon Learning Center and USBGF Teaching Pro. We've got a great match today between two very fine players. Uh, on your right is uh, the uh, in red is George Lazarus. He's the only player here from Greece, uh, and he is uh, the 2020 WBIF World Champion, uh, and he's. Not, he's only uh, never been to Monte Carlo before, but he's got uh, his records show that he's a very, very fine player. Uh, he's playing Gaz Owen, who most people know. He Gaz is one of the top players in London, uh, uh, in in England. He's from Bristol actually, and Gaz won Cyprus uh, recently. This is the fighters bracket, but this is a big match because. Uh, it happens to be the money round. Whoever wins this is guaranteed some money uh, and uh, has a chance, of course, to still win the tournament. Uh, the winner of the fighter's bracket, I think there's 12 players left, uh, will go on and play the winner of the undefeated. The undefeated is going on right now on the other stream with Wilcox, Snellings, and Zedek Ziska, uh, and, of course, Sander Lyloff and... Uh, 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 Benjamin Lund are the other two undefeated, so one of them will, uh, the, one of those four will go on to be in the undefeated bracket. So we've got a little ways to go. Uh, it's a 11 point match, and um, we'll take it from there. I'll do my best. Uh, I do see the chat. If you have a question, I'll try to catch it and try to answer it. I don't have you. I don't have uh, Extreme Gammon on this stream. I want to remind everybody watching, either recorded or live. To please click the like button. The more likes we have, the more backgammon will be recognized by search engines and the more popular our game will become. Okay, so here we go. Uh, George uh, is, black, is blue and uh, uh, Gaz is white. Let's check on the action here. Fairly early. Uh, and I like hitting here very, very much, especially with those two blots in the outfield. Uh, that Gaz has, if he doesn't hit, there's just so many rolls where Gaz can make the five point or the seven point. I like that as a, as a distraction, what we call maybe a tempo hit. And look what can happen. You might dance. There's four rolls out of 36, you don't come in. How do I know that so fast? Two times two is four. Two points made. If there were three points made, there would be nine rolls that don't come in. If there were four points made, there would be 16 rolls that don't come in. Okay. Uh, now he's hit a second checker. Uh, like the play a lot, and he dances. I think you got a double here. I'm not sure if you take. Uh, probably would pass. I would have thought a little bit more maybe about being too good. Uh, but I, I, I guess at this score, gammons are not real, real exciting to win uh, with the cube at 1 at 0, 0 to 11. But I still might have looked at that a little bit. I wouldn't have doubled quite so fast. Obvious, obvious drop. Okay. So, George draws first blood. There is a betting sheet here that Morton Holm put together, and uh, it shows uh, it shows Gaz as, as, a, as a strong favorite in this match, but uh, we know what that means. <laughs> if the dice have other ideas, that's it. Okay. I always split here with the two checkers on the eight point. I split those back checkers. And the book and extra Graham and agree with me, of course. <laughs> Good play. Six one. 
Do you hit two, or do you make the bar? You could come out. I don't see a good one if you just come out. 24, 23. Uh, I like hitting two because he's already made his three point a lower point, so that tells me I tend to want to play a hitting game. This would be my play, and I pretty much I think I would bet this play is right. People don't like to go to the ace point. It's kind of an ugly structure, but, you know, once you make the three point or the two point or the one point, I think you want to play a hitting game, and you have him outboarded. So that's another outboarded by meaning he has two interboard points and Gaz has none. Okay. A nine, he'd like to, he would have liked an eight there, but a nine plays. Uh, there's no good play here. I would probably just come out all the way. Hitting a second checker is fun. Trying to make an anchor if he gets hit. Yeah, if I'm going to hit, I am going to come up so that if I get hit back, maybe I can make a, a high anchor. This is not a bad play. It's interesting. Very aggressive. <laughs> I'm not... Again, it wouldn't be my play. My play was just to run the back checker all the way. <clears throat> but remember, I'm sitting here talking, and they're sitting there playing. So, <laughs> and not always right. We don't have XG right now. You want to play legal moves? Legal moves? Joe Urso, nice to see you, Joe. I'm hearing wonderful things about your game and how you've been progressing in recent years. And... Uh, you guys showed some really good results lately, and uh, I always knew you were a strong player. And you're right; there might have been a double before that last roll. Um, okay, I think the six is—I don't know—I I come out to the bar, to his bar, but coming down isn't bad. Coming, you know, the, all all plays are fairly close here. I don't think anything's any of the plays are really a blunder. I would. I would almost flip a coin. I, this is be this would be my play though. Mm. Okay. I always do the force part first. The four was forced. That's a very good three. There was no other good three anywhere, so you might as well make the point. Have a good anchor. I think you're hitting here. I think you're hitting 24 out to hit. Oh, he's not. Oh, I missed it. That's I. That's right. 6-2 is what I thought he rolled. 6-1. Yep. Yep. Make the anchor. I don't think the one is serious, but I... I, uh, I don't know. Since he has that anchor, I'd probably keep the three point and go up to the, go up to the opponent's five, but I don't think that's a big play either. 2-1. What else do you have besides the hit? Show me another play, and I'm very interested to see it. Unstacks your 6-point. I hit and play 9-8. Eight, eight to, nine to eight. That's it. 9-8 or 4-3. to three. That's my play. Thank you, guys. If I, if I made the same play as Gaz, that must have been right. Just run. They're both getting fairly ugly rolls here. <laughs> kind of fun, I think. When you don't see anything very simple. <clears throat> that play, I think, is pretty much forced. 6-3. Well, you come down and cover. Come down to your 8-point and cover. Show me another play. Slot the five. That starts. Yeah, this is my play. I didn't see much else that made sense. Okay. Pretty much forced that play. There's nothing else you really could do. Makes the point. It's lovely. <clears throat> you got to like, uh, slightly like George's position here. Funny, I just met George for the first time. I told him, I asked him where he lives. He said Athens, and I'm going to be in Athens in about a week. We're going to get together. Maybe take a little ride on his yacht. He already offered to take me for a ride. 
I like yachts. There's something about them that just, you know, that and private jets kind of turn me on. All right. No alternatives. Like Yogi Berra said, when you come into a fork in the road, take it. There's no way to go anywhere else but here. Show me another play. You don't want to throw checkers down to the three-point. Even if you're not winning the race, and it's he's not clearly winning the race here at all. Very probably White may be a little ahead in the race. Guys, I wish I could count pips faster. And I wish I had a board where I could push a button and tells me the pip count. I know some people say, well, that takes away some of the skill of the game. It's the skill of the game that I hate, that most of us hate. All right, six four, you hate to give up your midpoint. I'm not leaving the anchor, and I hate to go too deep, so I hate them all. But I, I actually do make this play and make the four point. I like this play. So where do you hate the least? The best play comes is often the, the least worst play. This is interesting. If you're if the race is close, you should block them and go to the nine point. If you're well ahead in the late race, you bring four down. And uh, that way you're not going to leave a direct shot. And you've cleared your midpoint. This, this play makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. this, this two is not critical. I like, to, I like to split from the midpoint. You can see that George is counting the pips while it's his opponent's turn. That's a real good use of the time, but he shouldn't be using his hand like that. That <clears throat> That's distracting to your opponent, and that's not, that's not kosher, and uh, I think it's somewhat a lack of experience for George to do that. I don't think he intentionally means to distract, but if I'm playing and my opponent is touching the board or putting his hand on the board, uh, I'm going to very, very nicely tell him the first time, and I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do the second time. Okay. Pretty clear, you just have to bury. Let's go all the way. Yep. <laughs> oh my goodness. This is such an easy take. I couldn't imagine. I wouldn't have thought about doubling here. Wow! And Gazop obviously didn't think very long. I really question that double when you've got your open seven and five point. The race is not gin at all. Uh, it's not an easy that easy a one to bring home. I I really question that cube. <clears throat> and he didn't think very long about it. I'll question that first of all. Give yourself some more time. It's I certain I'm pretty certain that wasn't a double. I I will take credit for inventing what we call reverse Wolsey's law, and I stole the idea from it. If somebody gives me a cube, I ask myself, "Am I sure it's a double?" And if the answer is no, then I'm sure it's a take. So that's what I would do, and certainly in this one, I would have been surprised. If I was playing and all of a sudden the cube came at me. By the way, I've been wrong too. Sometimes he's absolutely right. I just didn't, just don't see it. But uh, you can only go by what you know and what you think. Yeah, you see, he doesn't have a real simple, he's going to volunteer here. Why? <clears throat> I'm not sure. He, he's, he's not desperate enough. He's got enough flexibility to volunteer, not to volunteer. Philip Beyonce, how are you, my good friend from Paris? We miss you. I've always seen you here in Monte Carlo. I'm sorry you're not here. Although you're way too tall and way too handsome for me. All right, double threes. Plays very easily. You have to make the five point. And then you go behind him with one. An argument could be made to leave that outside blot and bring him in, and then you don't have to worry about clearing, but I don't think it's a good argument to leave this shot right now. See, this is a very fine double. Anybody who doesn't know that, working out pretty good, unless he rolls a one or a four. Double two is very good. 
Beautiful double. I certainly was right. Of course, I'm kidding. I still think it's wrong. I never play results. Never, ever. There's no other play. Take them off. There's no reason not to. No reason to get cute here. May as well make uh, make the ace point. I'm not worried about wasting a couple of pips here. It's not terrible if he doesn't. That's my play. Six and I now I play six to five. Nothing leaves a shot. It's flexible. I can pick and pass and point at him better. Um, I like this play a lot. Some people say, oh, I don't want to be odd. Being odd, if, you're, if both of those points are odd, that's good. I'm just running. I just don't see a future in staying. You're not likely to get gammoned if you stay, but so what are you going to do? You're going to bring it in, and your board's crushed almost. He's, no way he leaves a shot next time. What do you gain by staying? I just don't see it. But it can't hurt. It, can't, it isn't going to matter much either way. <clears throat> You can pretty much chalk this one up for George. <clears throat> so we have the next round at 10 p.m. tonight. And in between, I'm taking a dip in the Mediterranean, playing a little gin rummy with some friends and relaxing, going to a really incredibly lo lovely place for dinner. There's so many of them here. This is like no other tournament, all the time you have between matches and some wonderful things to do. And, of course, there's plenty of side events, but I can't enter any because it might interfere with my commentary. And I actually flew here basically to do commentary. I thought I was going to, you know, came here to win the championship, but something happened along the way that stopped that from happening. My problem was I faced too many women. I beat Akiko in the first round, then I had Karen Davis. So I, I need to find it draws where I don't have to play so many women because there's so many women, fine women players now. And I'm really excited this women in backgammon thrust is going on now and really bringing more women into the game and really educating them well. And Karen Davis is behind a lot of that. She's done tremendous things to promote the game in the last several years, not just for the USBGF, but for the world. And I respect her highly and all the other people who are promoting the game. And on the top of my list is Mark Olson, who has Backgammon Galaxy. If you haven't played on that site, it's fantastic. And he is the promoter of this tournament now. He owns uh, the Monte Carlo. And when you go to this website, take a look at their equipment. They have very nice Backgammon boards, baffle boxes. Scoreboards, all kinds of equipment. Um, so let's reward the people that are doing what they can to really promote this game. Linking up Galaxy with the World Championship is just brilliant. It's really helping promote the game terrifically. Okay, 3 nothing. Again, I did not like the cube. I can't wait to see if I'm wrong and by how much. But I... I like his bravado. I like it. He's not afraid that he's going right after it. And he, he's the WBIF champion, and he, he also did very well in the Nordic Open in one other tournament that he went to. Um, lost to Michael Larson, very fine player. So he's uh, he's got some... For a young man who hasn't played a lot, he's already got some impressive credentials. Oh, by the way, he's leading the WBIF right now. He's the, he's the, he's the leader right now. So I'm, I don't play in most online events because I'm too busy giving lessons. I give lessons online, and I also like to play once in a while. I live in Florida now. I play tennis every morning. I think that's helped my backgammon game by playing tennis just by being a little healthier and more in shape. There's no question that physical stamina comes into play, especially in these long matches and long tournaments. And it's becoming more and more a young man's game. It was becoming an old man's game for the last few years, and now we've got a lot of really great young players. Robello, who's still alive. Ziska, who's still alive. Kazuki. 
I can go on and on. We got a whole bunch of a whole bunch of really good ones. Gary Hority from the U.S., one of my favorites. This is a pretty aggressive uh, play, but I think you have to do it. Hope you don't get hit. You've got a very nice position here. Not much you could do here but anchor. Okay. When you anchor up on that four or five point, you're not going to get gammon very often, and you're never going to get prime, so there's some real benefit to it. Now, this is a hit, and I don't think I wouldn't be hesitating very long here because I don't see a really good alternative. Even though you're up in the race and you don't want contact, even though you're outboarded, hitting is almost always right in these situations. In the early, and this is an early, early to middle game, I always tell my students, can I hit? Can I make a point? Can I play strategically in that order? So unless you have a good reason not to follow that order, you should be hitting in these situations, certainly in the early game. And they both hit, as they should. Pause the clock. They drop the dice. Damn, if they would just use one of my baffle boxes, they wouldn't be doing that. Or one of the baffle boxes from, from uh, Galaxy. You wouldn't have so many dice on the floor. Okay, so... Uh, interesting. Gaz is on roll. Is he thinking? He's thinking about the cube. I don't see how you can double here. I think he had to be down a little bit more to make this a double. I think he's only losing three nothing. If I was losing six or seven nothing, I would double here. I don't think this is enough. Very, very easy take. I don't see that many market losers. Many sequences where George isn't taking on the next roll. Boy, did he miss a cube here. <laughs> you know he was going to roll double fours. That's that's. Uh, is that his best roll? I don't know. That's the nice thing about it. if you put this in extreme gamut, you hit dice distribution, and it tells you what your best rolls are and how good it was. And now he, I may, I may be wrong. He, it looks like he may have lost his market. But how many rolls were that good? Double four is great. Yeah, he's lost his market. This is a double and a pass. I don't think you take this cube, especially when you're winning three nothing. I like uh, one of my teachers at the Backgammon Learning Center, David Presser, has become very famous for being a great player, but also great at the cube. And he teaches and uses Pratt quite a bit. Position, race, and threats as a uh, as a way to analyze a position for the cube. And that one, you know, all three areas, uh, George was losing. Uh, position, race, and threats, all three favored uh, guys. So that, that's pretty... That usually means it's a pass. And again, he almost doubled the roll before. He's sorry he didn't now. But you don't, if you if you go around hindsighting yourself, you're playing the wrong game. Uh, this backgammon will give you the wrong lesson often. If you don't double, you'll roll great. If you do double, you'll roll crappy. <laughs> it seems to work that way all the time. Okay, do you switch, hit loose, or make the bar? I make the bar. I think this game's got a lot more game in it, and I, I like the bar here. But I'm willing to bet that Gaz gets it right. He's a grandmaster. He knows what he's doing. He's very sharp. But you start out by making the five point because you know it's right. So I would have made the bar. But uh, you didn't want him to just escape and... Turns out to be very nice that he hit. He stopped George from making the five point. But again, that's hindsight when you just look at the next roll. This play's obvious. And this play is not so obvious. I don't like coming up into the teeth. I think I bring two down. That's a lot of double outside shots with those two split, but I still think I do that. I don't like, I just don't like anything else. And I bring another one down, take take a shot at it. Okay. First thing I ask myself is if I do that, and if he were to double, would I take? My answer is yes, because he's not favored to hit. But he might double if you did that. If you make this play, I don't think he's doubling. 
And then, you know what? He might be right. You don't want to get the cube here. You're leading three to one. The other play might get you the cube. I ain't, I ain't afraid of no ghosts. Give me that cube. Maybe he won't give the cube. But maybe it, maybe it's good. I this I really don't like. I like his other play better. I like to have some, some outfield flexibility, some point making numbers. Yeah, I think this is. It's either this or two down. I, I, I'm not sure what I would do here. I know I would. I would do. I would bring the two down. If he doubled, I take. This play might be right just because it stops the double. So maybe that. Maybe that's the acid, the litmus test that tells you to make this play instead. I don't think you double this one, and he isn't. The other one, he might have a cube, because the upside could be very, very big. Well, four comes down, I think, and you slide up. You don't make a point here. Six, five, you just run and pray. Hope he doesn't roll a seven or a nine. And God should be thinking seven, nine. Didn't roll either. I still don't like making a point on the inner board. I don't like making the three point. I would probably just make my bar. And he agreed. Six, five is a very poor roll. I only see one play and that's 24 to two. I mean, I'm sorry, it's 18 to 2. I don't see anything that makes any more sense than that. I mean, even then I might get again. Yeah, you just got to take it all the way. Take your medicine. Come on. What else is there? And then the question is, is it a cube? And it might be. I don't like a double shot here. If he doubles here, I'm passing. So if I make this play and I'm passing, I know I'm not making this play. Now, I'm not sure if I'm passing the other play. This play, he might not even double. I would double this, by the way. And he won seven or nine, and you're in Gammon City. So I would double either play, but I would make the one that leaves the fewer shots and hope he doesn't double. See, this one I would just pass. The other one I might, might have some play, which might stop the cube. And he does double very quickly. He agrees with me, and I would pass. You get hit uh, 20 times plus, that's it, 20 times. Any, any one or three. Um, and if you don't get hit, you have to cover, which you don't always do. And a lot of your, a lot of times you get hit, you do get gammon. A very strong board on the other side. And also because you're winning three to one, that's another reason I like to pass here. And again, that's why I make the other play. The other play might not get the cube. It's the only ones that hit. It's not a pretty position, but it's the only ones that hit. So I, this decision that he has now, I would have made this decision before the before the move. I wouldn't. I don't blame him for taking time. And even if I was pretty sure before the move what I would do, it's still right to take time and use your clock. He's got plenty of time on the clock, and this is an important decision. Okay, he's taking. I would have passed. Six out, the front checker, or bring a builder down. I don't, I don't know that you need to bring the builder down, but it can't hurt. I like six out for another reason. What if, hap what happens if uh, he rolls a three six? You wanted that second number to hit. So guys agreed with me again. It's a very good roll to come in and hit. And he's still not happy he took this cube. This is a clear anchor in my opinion. Thinking about slotting the back of the prime to make the six prime. But I think it's very strong to make your opponent's four point here. That's my play. Oh, so far, guys and I are playing the same. I don't think we disagreed on a play. And i uh very proud if I can play like us. A uh, fairly ugly roll. There's a big argument to bring two down. There he goes. That's my play. 
<laughs> if he doesn't roll an ace, I've got a beautiful game. If he rolls an ace, he's got a blot in his inner board. Don't mind getting into a hitting battle. You compare the boards. This is my play. I don't like that play. Even here, if he hits, he doesn't cover. I did not like that play. That's the first place where Gaz and I parted company. <clears throat> there, he could run the back checker all the way. I can see this play, though, playing more offensively and keeping the anchor. He didn't even look at the possibility of running it out. So I'm probably wrong. I was looking at it. Maximum builders. Bring in the... Uh, I think you got to bring that in five and then bring bring a checker. Wow. He's really going for blood here. I wouldn't do that. That's five and then to the four point. That's it. You, you can make it too many natural ways to have to gamble with the, with the blot. And you're hitting loose now with anything. Unless you roll a one or a six, you're hitting with anything. About 16 pointing numbers. Well, he can't move the back checkers. This is very bad roll. You make the two point and pray, I think. What else is there? Make the two point and hope he doesn't run. Ah, told you this was a take. Although, I was very, very lucky not to get hit there or pointed on. But nobody, including Mochi, ever won a game of backgammon without some luck. You can always point to a few lucky rolls. That's part of the game. In fact, if anything, you might say that backgammon is a game where you're playing to put yourself in a position where you can get lucky and win. And whoever puts themselves in the position that has more lucky rolls is the one that's going to win. So when people say there's luck in backgammon, I don't argue with them at all. And if they say it's all luck, I say you're absolutely right. Do you have a board? Let's play. I, there's no way in hell that I'm redoubling here. Not only are there racing chances... Or guys, there are hitting chances and lots of wastage uh, for George. And I, I just cannot fathom a recube here. I haven't done a pip count, but it certainly isn't lopsided enough to give a cube with those open points. Three open points in front of you, in front of your back point. I just don't know how this is a recube. But again, I can never fault anybody for taking the time and thinking about it. And by the way, when you stop and think about it and you don't double here and you get a little bit of improvement, and you double quickly the next time you often get a pass. I don't think this is an initial double, which means that it can't be a redouble. redouble you got to even be better for a redouble at most scores. Some scores, that's not true. Slot the ace. Okay. It didn't get any better. Come on, just roll. White has 98. Eighty-three. Hmm. We do have a fifteen-point pip lead now. So maybe I was wrong before. The pip. He had enough. He had a big enough race, but not enough to double because of the position. No choice here. You just got to go behind and play safe. You go behind with both, though, is the question. And I don't think you do. I like his play. He's up enough in the race where he can burn. 
And I'd rather have the flexibility in case uh, Gaz comes out with one. And uh, Gaz doesn't have a lot of really good timing to hold that to hold that four point. So I like this play a lot. And Gaz might. No, I, th I don't think he runs here. Come in and make the point. The race isn't close enough for him, I don't think, to run. That's my play again. All right, guys, we're in sync. We'd make good doubles team. Or is a good doubles team one that disagrees more? I'm not sure. Sixty nine for guys. Hmm. Five four. Now these are the awkward rolls that you expect to get from these positions. You have to just play safe here and hope. But again, Gaz is gonna have to break his board to run. I he can run now with that blot though, and I will. Keeping your board is very important here. That checker isn't in that bad a jeopardy because of the blot on the three-point. And it still can't be a double, I don't think. Not a redouble. I agree with this no doubles. Three-two. Uh, here's why he's leaving he's leaving his first shot here and I'm breaking the back point if you break the uh, if you break the front point the eight point uh, and you get away with it you still have to bring those other checkers in so <clears throat> I would just break the ten point naturally there is an argument for taking both checkers off the six and getting him out of there and it's the fewer shots, it's only 11 numbers if he does break the six point. But it sure is going to be harder to bring in the rest of those checkers, I think. But it, I, it's, it's an interesting play. That might be the play. Yeah, I think there's a real argument for this. I think I like this play. Only 11 shots. If he comes in behind, I don't have to worry about that blot so much. If he doesn't hit, I'm likely to cover or lift. That, that would be my play. I like that. And of course, he's punished. One, two, three, plays. Two, three, four plays. Two, three, four. Okay. You could see that uh, would be a very, very nasty thing had he given the cube. There's no question in my mind Gaz was taking, though he was right not to recube for sure. Another double four. One, two, three, and off. Very smooth. Very smooth. 5-1. I know this play. You're supposed to clear the 6 if you have a spare on the 3. I'm clearing the 6 point there. Uh, I learned that from Jake Jacobs. With the spare on the 3 point, you're better off because he can come in behind you and you never leave a shot. Although, when you're playing for the gammon, there is argument to do this. I, My play is right if, you're, if there's no gammon value or no gammons. So maybe his play is right. He did it pretty quickly. I was going to just assume I wasn't going to get a gammon here and make sure I win this game, and I would have cleared the six. I can't wait to look at that play. But that's the that's the, the litmus test is whether or not you have a spare in the three. That way, threes, twos, and ones all protect you from leaving a shot. Okay, this game is history, and again, maybe George was thinking about the double just to tease Gaz a little bit, because Gaz has got to be thinking there, give it to me, baby, give it to me, on the recube. I do that sometimes. If I really don't like somebody, I like to tease them, and unfortunately, almost everybody I play, I like too much. <laughs> I didn't used to be that way. I'm, I'm telling you, years ago... There were a lot of bad actors in this game. There were cheaters. There were nasty people. There was bad, poor sportsmanship. 
And because of our incredibly good tournament directors and the uh, the attitude that we see in our top players, particularly people like Mochi and the Japanese players, the good sportsmanship that we have all the time, I'm seeing the level of this game has gone up incredibly. It's a much classier people, much classier game. And, of course, we got some goofy people, but they behave themselves because they're not going to get away with it anymore. All right, it's an eight-point match. Eight away, eight away. I like this play. He's already got some outfield coverage with the checker on the uh, five-point. And coming out to the bar, could get him hit once or twice. Now he has to make the bar, make the 18-point. It's a good point to hold, and you... He saw stacked. I, I like this play a lot. <clears throat> and he gets a shot right now. I slot the five. You could hit off the ace, but then where's your where's your ace? You're leaving two blots. Make the four point. You, you don't want to run here. You don't want to come off the back, I don't think. Make the four point. There you go. Guys, we're in sync, you and me today. This is pretty obvious. Make two points. Make the 11 point. There you go. So what do you think Gaz is thinking? Do you think the number four has uh, entered his mind a little bit here? It should. And that's why he rolled it, because he was thinking it. It's the mind control theory. I've said this before, but when you think of a number that hits, when you roll it, you're not going to miss the shot. It's easy to see that was a 4, but what if you had a 9 or an 11? Lots of people miss those shots. They don't see it, and they should have been calling that out in their head before they rolled. I don't quite think you're here yet, the double. Five checkers on your opponent's side of the board. Uh, don't, I, I don't know. It could be. I, I, I wouldn't double this. Uh, I, again, you, know, you start with Wolsey's Law and ask myself, if I were George, would I take it? And the answer is yes. How do you lose your market? Well, it's not that hard to lose your market. You make the five-point or the two-point and get a dance. Let's say you just bring your checker around into the zone. Say you roll a high number, bring the checker off the 20-point and bring it around. Have you lost your market? If Only if he dances. So remember, he's coming in. 20 out of 36 times, only dancing six, 16 times. So again, I don't think I don't think I cube. But my buddy Keen from Madison, Wisconsin, he doubles, but he drinks a lot of scotch. So and he could be right. All right, Keen, you want a ten dollar bet? I say no double. I'm trusting you not to be using any aids, and I he's one of the people in the world I certainly trust. Terrific tournament director and a good, great player. Okay, Keenan and I got a bet on this one. I say no double, and he says double. And somebody said, I already enumerated a lot of market losers. Remember, those market losers all disappear 16 times that you come in. He's probably got a take when he comes in. All right, Gaz agrees with me. We should have just bet on what Gaz would do. Because that's almost as good as XG. Keen, we bet 10 bucks. Phone XG means nothing, Joe. You know that. I'm one of the developers and promoters of XG, and I don't trust the phone. And by the way, when I make a bet, 0.02 or less is a tie. XG++. plus plus. Okay. <clears throat> One six, just come out to the bar. Be happy you didn't double, because this could be prop. This could be trouble right now. A two or a pointing number, double hit. Look at this. George is thinking about the cube. No way I cube here if I'm George either. 
Double six is uh, a tasty roll. Out and in. In and out. What else are you going to do? Oh, make the two point. I wouldn't do that. That's, you're leaving yourself too vulnerable. Because you can cube him out now uh, if he dances. As you know, he's only dancing nine times. Comes in with a one four. <laughs> I'm tempted here. Am I, all right, again, I keep harping on it, but Wolsey's Law. Um, if I were Gaz, would I take this cube? And my answer is yes. But that doesn't mean it's not a double. The main reason you double when you think your opponent should take is if you think you're going to lose your market. When that means that on the next sequence, after the next time it's your roll, you think there's going to be a pass too often. Now, in a money game, too often has been defined by John O'Hagan as 25%. And I, I, think it's, I think it's a good double here because I'm not wild about getting this cube. I've got a little trick called Simborg's Law. Ask yourself, how would you feel about getting this cube? And the answer is, I would rather, much rather he didn't double. I'd rather not have to take this damn cube. That's another reason to give the cube. If you put yourself in your opponent's seat and you say, this cube doesn't bother me that much, I'm definitely taking, then it probably isn't a double. So, I, again, I'm not happy about getting this cube if I'm Gaz. 8 away, 8 away, to go to 8 away, 7 away is not a huge thing, but all right. My initial instinct was right. I would have taken it, and so would Gaz. He's got shot Vig. Not likely to get Gammon very often, holding that bar point. Love it. Yes. Rare. All right. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Th thank you, Rory Pascar, for taking looking after me for lunch. My buddy Rory from Chicago is here running side events and running for lunch. They have a wonderful breakfast buffet here that's included in our room that we do every morning, and we sit around with all the players and have great conversations. Then I went out by the pool. It's a tough life. Just looked at the beautiful sights around the pool. <clears throat> um, I'm talking about the yachts, of course, and things like that. A um, little bit of uh, bazooki gammon with some friends. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, here's a question. You're going to run out of time. I think you have to hold. I think you have to hold the bar point. I don't think you're gaining enough in the race to get there. But that's what he's counting. 42, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 94 for blue. I got to visualize where they're going to be. I don't think it was a blunder to jump to the 18 at all. Um, I thought that was a, the right play as you start crashing and you start putting checkers where you don't want them. Uh, it's usually right to answer Bogdan's question. I thought the I thought that was the right play. Although I was concentrating on my hamburger just then. I may have missed it. So if, if white has 90 after the roll, the 92 is up two pips, but blue is on roll. But I still call this an even race because when you're holding the cube in a longer race, the value of holding the cube is about 18%. So you're going to win about 18% more because you're holding the cube than if, it was, if there was no cube. Why? Because you can use the cube to end the game. For example, if you don't redouble when you're 80% and your opponent drops, you've now picked up 20% wins because of the cube. And the cube also gives you the ability, let's say you're 75-25 favorite. It gives you the ability to double the stakes to a higher level when you're a 3-to-1 favorite. 
So for all those reasons, the cube big is about 18%. So in this case, I think you run. The other problem is if you don't run, you could easily run out of time and crash your board. So I really like this play. Assuming that uh, Keen gave me the right pip count. So he's committing to a pure race, and I, I like that because, again, coming in is, could be wastage, and he got two crossovers that way. So the double four was actually, I think, a very good roll. It's one of his better rolls. Staying there and waiting for the shot, he's very likely to get it and very likely to miss it, and he might not get it at all. And he might get it too early and hit it and still lose. <laughs> so I like I like his, I like Gaz's approach to the racing. Uh, I think it was a very very foolish move for Gaz to race here. He should have stayed back for the shot. Yeah, how could he think he could win this race? But the more I think about the cube, I like this take. I would have taken, and I like the take because it doesn't cost you that much to lose two points instead of one at this score. And if you turn it around, and he almost did. If he had rolled these high numbers, he'd have a nice turnaround. <clears throat> be a three-point swing of winning two instead of losing one. Three points is a lot of equity in that match. Yeah, good legal moves. <clears throat> this is not a legal moves tournament, but obviously the, the guys have agreed to it. But legal moves or not, you're going to correct your guy, your opponent, from taking an extra, stealing an extra pip on you. If Bill Wiles or Tara is watching, could one of them come here and help me out a little bit? Getting some nasty posts on our on our Facebook on our YouTube page. Maybe there's a way to block it. Okay, they're taking a break. Good, good time to take a break because I could use one. See you in a, just a bit. Please hit the like button. Please visit Galaxy.com. Back at Galaxy.com.
Hey, I just took a look at the other channel. Zednik is uh, beating Wilcox Snelling 10 to 2. Wilcox has had a very, very tough ride to get to here. He three of his last four matches, he got the double match point, and the match he won that I did the commentary on yesterday, he was losing eight to nothing and came back to win. Uh, but now he's losing 10 to two, and I the match to 17. I wouldn't rule him out. And I, I certainly, nobody is going to make anybody a big favorite over Zednik Ziska, the, the Marvel from Czechoslovakia. He's an amazing kid. Uh, kid, again, he's, he's, a, he's a young man now, but I've known him since he was a, a little kid. Uh, he and his mother uh, started coming to these tournaments a while back to protege of uh, falafel. But he's on his way to a possible victory. Um, now... You're asking about links to the bracket. You go to um, here. I think I have it on my. Uh, it's called drawboss.com. D r a w b o s s dot com. You log in or get an account there, and you click on the 53rd BGWC, and you'll see the brackets. You'll see the draw for all the. Remaining, and you and uh, it's really, and also you can go to my Facebook page, PJ Simborg Facebook page, and Bill Davis posted the links. You can just click on those links to see each division if you want to that way. <clears throat> and I think you can go to the Back Edmund World Championship page, of course, I uh, Facebook page uh, or website, the website, and it'll show you how to get to Draw Boss and how to see. But just to give you a quick rundown, there are four undefeated players left. Wilcox playing Zednik, Sander Lyloff playing Benjamin Lund. Um, and I'm really, you know, Sander's a marvel, has been for years. Doesn't play a lot of backgammon, but when he does, he's as good as anybody in the world. Benjamin Lund, I'm proud to say, attended two or three of the seminars that Mochi and I put on when we were doing uh, boot camps around the world. And he really impressed me years ago and he's getting better and better and he is a grandmaster the undefeated players john o'hagan is playing the bald thompson michael larson playing fernando barconi these are one these are one lost players in the fighters bracket patrick didishem against Ilya jart tardin uh ronald amorium against nee nugin my good buddy steve Sachs is playing simon bargett johan mozowit is playing Karsten Brendel, John Kristen Roysett is playing Thomas Kazima, Mario Bundefico is playing Neil Berkman, uh, Lawrence Powell playing Ronnie Rubin, you're watching George and Gaz, Hans Libby playing Dimitri Loy, Sampo Nikasin playing Ryan Ribello. Um, John O'Hagan is still alive and he, is, he was a finalist. In fact, I think he played around 2.4 PR when he lost the finals of Monte Carlo few years ago uh and uh bob octel did the same thing he played somewhere around under two and a half and lost in the finals so uh my hats off to people who play that well win or lose and they're both great sports and great players unfortunately bob is not here this year but i'm still rooting for john he's my co one of my co-teachers he's helped me a lot personally with my game and with my teaching and of course, Steve Sachs also. So I'm a little prejudiced uh, towards that. I have no prejudice in this match and for the, most of the rest of it. But um, fortunately, no, my prejudices have nothing to do with the outcome. <laughs> okay. I liked, uh, I liked the way both players played there. I pretty much agree much more so for with, with more of... Um, Gaza's plays and decisions that I do with George, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean that I'm any better or worse than anybody there, or Gaza's or George's, just a matter of opinion. There's still enough room in this game for to have your own styles. We're getting some nasty posts about dating sites on the on the chat, and I talk to our tech people here. There's nothing we can do to stop it. <clears throat> it's 
So looks like George is ready to go and raring to go and waiting for Gaz. And here comes Gaz. <laughs> It's a huge tournament room, very well lit, very beautiful site. You won't find a better venue to play in anywhere. But it is a long way to the bathroom. <laughs> and they're in a private room. There's nobody else in that room except the other game that's going on in that room, which is the uh, Wilcox and Zednik game. Okay, so we've got a score of six away. Eight away. Nothing to really want to change your game dramatically on the initial cube, but recubes would very definitely have some changes here. Can you hit or make a point in the early game? See, you hit instead of make the point. The only thing you wouldn't hit with there was the three one, because the five point is so good and the one is too awkward to where you don't have return shots without breaking your eight point. So you hit everything you can at that second roll after he comes out to your bar. Uh, except for the 3-1. Or unless you can hit on the other side of the board, if you'd roll a 6-4, for example. That's just a, just a written in stone. In and hit. And in and hit is probably what I'm going to be saying right now on the next roll. Uh, in, and, uh, hmm, uh, the only hit is off the ace point. That's interesting. And you might make the ace point here. A lot of play, it, it used to be ridiculously wrong in everybody's opinion. Uh, but, um, somebody's saying a better venue is a private beach house. You know, I might agree with you there. It's a matter of taste, but I'm running a tournament in Jamaica uh, in October that's exactly there at a private beach house right on the beach in Ocho Rios. It's an amazing tournament. If you'd like more information on it, email me. My name is Phil Simborg, and my email is phil at sim.org. And I'll send you all the information on Jamaica. Mochi's coming. Uh, several people from England, Canada. It would be a, an incredible event. Okay, 4-2. Again, we're hitting. And you hit, you'd rather hit <coughs> on his side of the board than your own. Cost him more pips and puts more checkers back. Stops him from making points on his side. So given a choice, you could have hit on either side. Almost always you want to hit. You want to hit where it hurts him more or cost him more pips. I'm not sure I like making the east point there. I, I'm still a little bit old school and don't love that play. Hmm? No. Double two. Hit. Come down. That's it. Got a boy. A minute hit. Nice roll. Okay, George has made the ace point. His game plan should be playing a hitting game. That's it's not gonna be much of a priming game. It's kinda hard to race safely into your board when your ace point is made, unless your opponent is is completely out of touch there. I like the three point here. I can understand a couple of other possibilities, but I don't see anything I really love. I'm making the three point. What what is he thinking of here? What's the best alternative? Ah three across from the fourteen and five down. Okay. Again, we agree. Hmm. Yep, you Almost always hit with here when you're George when you make your ace point. Even though you're outboarded, you've only got that one game plan. I always think about game plan. I read a great book by Kasparov, Kasparov, Kasparov the world's great chess player. It's called How Life Imitates Chess. 
my, one of my students recommended it, and he, what the main thing he stresses in that book is, if you don't have a plan, you got no hope. And the plan for chess, as in life, is so critical, and it applies to backgammon very, very well. And so many players play this game, looking at the dice, looking at the checkers, and trying to decide without ever even thinking about what is my overall strategy. Should I be racing, blocking, hitting, or playing a high anchor game? Okay, you're leaving a shot. Put it where it'll help him when you don't get hit and make him come off of his anchors to hit you. And he's got a blot in his inner board. That's a very nice roll. <clears throat> I think you make the you make the three point and come out. You make the three point. You could continue. Could start getting into a racing game if he doesn't get hit by continuing. Because it's kind of ugly to make the three point and you strip your outfield. This might be right. I'm not sure. I would make the three point though. Because that of a blot in the inner board, I sort of hate to give up the uh, the anchor. Sorry, Michael, that Jamaica is far away, but there is one plus. The weekend, be, the week before the Jamaica tournament, is the Fort Lauderdale, Florida tournament. So come, and you'll get two tournaments for the price of one. And there'll even be a qualifiers event at the Florida tournament where you can get a free entry into the Jamaica tournament. We have five thousand dollars added, money added. We've got a mochi challenge in Jamaica, and there's a and the Florida tournament itself is a great tournament. So it's a great double, and it's not a it's not long flight from Florida to Jamaica. It's hip, it's a hop, skip, and a jump. Everybody who's been to the Jamaica tournaments that we've had in the past, I just I just had one by the way last month. I just, it, loved it. It's an incredible venue though. On the beach, play outdoors or in if you, in a nice air conditioned area if you want. Incredible hospitality. Okay, let's get back to this game. I see one play. Great players see five plays, or maybe sometimes great players only see one play. Well... One, two, three, four. What are you going to do next roll? What are you going to do next roll, George? I think maybe two down might have been right there. <laughs> if you don't hit the shot, getting hit a shot now, what now? What are you going to do? You're going to leave a blot. No, you're not. You're not going to leave a direct. That's a great roll. That's one of the few really good rolls from that position. If you don't get hit with an eight or a nine, and he doesn't, I slot two points. I know you might get a shot next time. It might be indirect, but if you don't slot two points, you could you could bring a checker into your six point. Might be right not to slot two for that reason. Yeah, I like this play. Oh come on, don't don't tell me you're thinking about doubling here. You're leading in the match. It's way too easy to take. Roll the dice. And he does. Now, do you make a point in front of him, or do you go behind him? Personally, I would make the point, because it's a landing point. Make the right point, though. Okay. I would step it to make the point. But that's... I would have looked at that a little bit more. But I think I would have made the point. And then you got two points to clear. There's that argument. Uh, sorry, Michael, I have no updates on the other matches right now. I'm a little busy right here. <laughs> so, maybe when there's a break, I can check it out. <clears throat> this is not a double. It's just too easy a take and too hard to bring home. And again, you're winning. This is I don't think this is a double for money. And if it's not a double for money, then it can't be a double when you're ahead in the match. <clears throat> I 
Remember to click the like button, everybody. He's certainly going to hold the point. Just go one checker all the way to the ace would be my play. Save a six because you might not want to have to run with a six next roll. <clears throat> That's my play. Again, Gaz and I <clears throat> are in sync pretty much the whole match. I, no, no, no. I don't. Now, now this five has to crash. I don't like that one. I would have gone to the ace point there. Make the two. I did not like George's play there with the one. There it is. He rolls the five. Now he crashes the board. If he had kept the one, he still have his board. Now he's thinking about keeping the five. He learned the lesson the hard way that he might be helpful to have a checker there. He takes it off the six point now. His next five will be very uncomfortable, but he did. Again, now it's not quite as critical because in this spy versus spy game, Gaz may have to blink first, and he does. He does get the shot. There are 17 ways to hit, so he's not favored. 17 out of 36 is less than half. And not only does he not hit, he has to leave the shot himself. Now he's got 17 ways to hit, plus he's winning the race. This is going to be a double. I would double here. Why is he? Okay, he is thinking. I mean, he could roll under a six with some numbers, but I, I certainly give the cube here and let, and, and uh, I think this is a very good double. Winning the race and 17 shots. I'm not sure it's a take. Although getting hit isn't gin because you've got an open board, but I'm probably going to pass this cube. He did pass it. Okay. Guys, you and I could. So far, we're nailing it. And I haven't done commentary on too many matches where I've agreed so often with one of the players that much. And it's not because we're both experts. It's because most of the commentary I do, the players are better than me. And I would put Gaz in that category. I don't know if George is, but I know Gaz is. George probably is too. <clears throat> those who can do and those who can't teach. That's me. Hey, now you hit twice. I always hate this play, but I know it's so right by such a huge amount that I have to do it. And the alternative just isn't very pretty. Double two. Oh, he can hit another checker. He can make the bar. He can make the four. <clears throat> I'm hitting another checker. I'll put a second checker up myself. Either that or make the four. Making the bar doesn't make sense to me here. I don't make the ace point. That's my play. All right. Here's one of the few times I agree with George. And I've disagreed with George a lot, and he's winning the match. So what does that tell you? <clears throat> There's an argument to make the three point and cover the ace. Make the three point and make the bar is another possibility. I don't I think I like making the three point and the bar point. Now I make the three point. That's me. Again, I I think he's he pointed right. He just run all the way. Neil Williams, this is all the spam. I would love to. I would love to get rid of it too, but we found out we can't do it. That's a good roll. Very nice roll. Make the bar is pretty obvious. 
<clears throat> Alright, I want to attack here. Oh, the five points, beautiful. <clears throat> George really needs a six. No, but that's a very good roll. If you're not going to roll a six, that's a dream roll. Oh, talk about dream rolls. This is what we call a six prime. Or do you go to the deuce? I bring the two down and make the six point. Six prime. Yeah, there you go. And now we think about what's good, what we're going to do with the cube. I double and I, I double. And most prime versus primes are takes. And this could be a take. But losing, winning the match, I would pass this. If the score was even, I might be very tempted to take this. Yep, it passes. It's too gammonish. It might even be passed for money, too. I have a saying that actually Stick helped me with. Almost prime, most normal prime versus primes or takes. The question is, was that normal? Was that within the range of normalcy where the trailer can win around 30%? That's what makes it... That's the definition of normal. If you can win within around 30%, and if he doesn't get gammon more than 18%, that's it stays in the definition of normal. But again, you throw some of that out when you're looking at a match, and especially when you're ahead in the match and it's gammonish like that. So I like that cube action. I, I think it's double pass. Progressing very quickly here. The five away, seven away. Five, two, you make two downs. What else? Very clear. <clears throat> oh, that's a good roll and a good play. You're not going to come out now. When, when are you going to get out of there? Yes, you're probably going to get hit. Yes, you do get hit. And you split the back. Split the back because he's got two checkers on the eight. You don't have a really great one anywhere else. And that's, that's just the time to do it while he's on the bar. This, to me, this is automatic to play 24-23. Why not? Oh, no. Oh, I hate this play. Please don't. Oh, please don't do that. Oh, I just don't see it. I don't see it. Great roll for George. I don't like that one that George played. We'll have to see if there's some reason with it for it. Not much you can do here in the five down. George would love an eight. Two one plays. And George is in the driver's seat right now. Okay, what are the options? You can hit him off the ace with the five and bring a six down or out. You can just run with one checker from the back. If you run... You know what? I'm going to run. I'm coming off the three point and I'm going. I don't like the alternatives. I don't think there's that many pointing numbers. That's my play. a boy, George. If the guys were in sync again... And you're winning the race. And now you've forced me to hit loose. No other play. Looking for a four. And he gets it. Great roll. There isn't a good three. So you play safe. You could go. I don't think it's right to go to the bar here. Too many return shots. I like the safe play. Again, I'm I'm hitting. Got to keep them off balance. There's your four. Beautiful. Two goes to the three point or the eight point. Yep, I like this. I would have gone to the three point there, I think. Kept that outfield. Now... Because you're losing the match, you're up in the race, you got race position and threats, I like the double. And he passed. And I would have passed it too. You can take ace point games at certain scores and in a little bit better position or timing, but 
it's not always a drop just because you're holding the ace point. A lot of people just automatically do, but I think that was a pass. Well, the pickle finger of fate or Lady Luck is sort of swinging back and forth with these guys. While I have not liked a couple of George's plays, I, I wouldn't call, I, I didn't see anything I really call a blunder except maybe that one cube action that I thought might be a, I might call that a blunder, but I could be wrong too. That tells me that the three of us are playing well, including myself. Well, talk about racing. Three down and one across. That was a big roll for Gaz. He doesn't get hit here. He may have a cube. Let's count the race here. He may not be up enough in the race. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty, twenty, twenty-eight, hundred and thirty-four for blue. Twenty, forty, sixty. Yeah, I think he's. I think he is up enough to, to double here. I. I think I. I like this double. I would. I would give him the cube and let him worry about whether he should take or not. 134, 20, 40, 60, 70, 85. Yeah, I, I'm doubling here, especially when you're, you're, you're losing. And he did double, I agree. Goss and I have agreed on virtually everything. And I, the, oh yeah, the, Bill Rowles just came by and pointed out that the, uh, that George's clock is pretty low on time. I didn't. I don't remember George taking that long. That taking way too long. Yeah, he did take long on a few plays where I kept. Remember, I said, "Well, I can't fault him for taking the time," but the clock may become an issue for George. I love watching Mochi play when his opponent gets real low on time. I saw Mochi. In San Antonio once in the semifinals, I get to play the winner in the finals. I'm watching Mochi um, play um, uh, Ron Lareo from uh, South America. And Ron had three seconds at his clock. Last game, Mochi has an opening 6-1 and slots two points. <laughs> he played that game at 22 PR, and um, Ron never got flustered. Never ran out of time and went on to win the, the game and the match. And uh, the play didn't work, but it was sure fun to watch. And then Ron went on to beat me in the finals of San Antonio uh, and played very, very well. But it, it was so much fun to watch Mochi do that. When he had that 6-1 and slotted two points, everybody's mouths dropped. Okay. Uh 5-2. Well, guys, you got to do something. You got to make, make the 18 point or the 16 point. I think you make the 18 point and slot your own 4 point. Let's see if we continue to be in sync. You could make the 11 point. There's a lot of stuff you can do. Again, I don't mind George counting tips when it's my turn, but keep your hands away from the board. That's a distraction. I know he's not doing it intentionally, uh, doing any kind of trick or number on his opponent, but it's wrong. I have no clue what the play was there. I really don't know. I think you slot your five point. That's what I would do. That's the point you want. Like Paul McGrill said, listen to the checkers. They tell you where they want to be. They want to be on the five point. Okay, good play. Well, you don't come out because you're losing this race and you need to get a shot. So 
This is pretty simple. Slot your five and come down, or slot two points. Slotted two points is fine. Two one is also pretty simple. You could have made the four point instead and not be stacked there, but the five point is so valuable, it's probably worth a little stack. Okay. Hmm. <clears throat> This is not a comfortable roll. So go ahead and make your four point. At least you got a real super asset out of it. That's me. I think George must be aware of his clock. He's playing faster now. Okay, he hits and doesn't see where else, what else to do. I'll show you what else to do. You hit, you make your bar, and you keep that checker going one more time. Guys, we've agreed on every play. You're going to make my play here. Skill is luck becoming a habit. Hmm, i got to give that some thought. That's way over my head. My head's starting to hurt. The deeper the thought, the more I want a beer. That's my saying. I'm hitting, playing another one with the same checker, and making the bar. Come on, guys. We've agreed on everything else. <laughs> Why that? <clears throat> this is a much better structure. Not as easy to bring. All right. Finally, he made my. Why didn't, why didn't he just make my play to start with and save some time? Okay. I still don't think there's cube action here. He's got a lot of work to bring it home. I, I don't think this is a double. I think I'm, it's such an easy take. He's got a lot of work to do. I take it. I didn't think it was a double, so I'm taking it. And he passed it. That shows you what I know. Okay, one of Wilsey's thoughts and sayings is, if you don't double, there's only one guy that could be making a mistake. <laughs> so give your opponent a chance to make a mistake. If you're not quite sure, maybe you're better off giving the cube. I think that was a mistake to pass. I think it was a mistake to double. And it probably was a double pass. So I'm probably wrong on both out, both both areas. These are hard. Doubles are really hard. Double twos is the one that causes the most headaches. But double fours can be plenty hard, too. You, you want to make your opponent's 20 point. You'd like to make your five point. But making two points is better than one. And this is two pretty good points. Well, Gaz was, I think it was, was he losing 3 nothing early in the match or 4 nothing, But he's come back and he's leading. Good roll. Make the bar and come up. Well, yeah, that's for sure. He could just run out, but the five point, I, I meant make the five point. Five point so valuable. This play is clear. Pretty obvious. In the semi, ZZ leads Wilcock, 12-5. Sander leads Benjamin Lund, 9-4. These are to 17. Thank you, Bill Riles, for the update. Of course, Bill Riles and Tara Mendocino are doing all the streaming at many, many major tournaments to do an incredible job. They've got amazing equipment and their technology and 
The quality is fantastic. It's expensive to have them and all that equipment, and its tournament directors are seeing that it's well worth it. And what it does for the game is terrific. It's stacky, but I, I would make the play. I'd make the point and stack them anyway. It's ugly. One of my favorite players of all time and my good friend David Wells. And you ask him why he makes one player or another, he's, it goes by whether it's ugly or pretty and how pretty it is. Other players will tell you, give you a bunch of numbers and give you a bunch of statistics and tell you that you're 16% better here and you get hit nine times more here. He just tells you, that's not as pretty. And I think both approaches work, although David can certainly give you the numbers too. <clears throat> the best players are both visual and mathematical. I don't know a top player that isn't mathematical that can't give you the numbers. I don't think you can get to the top without it. Falafel used to pre pretend that he did a lot by feel, and I know damn well he was doing the numbers because Falafel and I used to teach together and work together and play together a lot. And he, he could do the numbers as well as anyone. Okay. I agreed. No double here. Too much work to do. Two, two out is lovely. Two out is lovely. As long as he doesn't roll a 10 or a 10. Or double fours. Whoa. You see that first four, you start to sweat. The race was, you, the race was just too much down. When your opponent's on your three point, you're, you can actually take down as much as 23 in the race if there's a gap in front. That's a number I learned from Mochi uh, in a seminar we did together. But he's stripped here. And he, there's not a big gap there. It, you're getting very close to a double here. It'd be nice to cover the one point if you could also cover in the outfield, but I think it's too rich. Myself, I'm making the 12 point. Oh, actually, you could cover and come down to the 9. Yeah, I like this. I like this. I didn't see that at first. You got to look around. Look at every possibility. I have a saying, when you roll doubles, find a great play. And then look for a better one. If you're coming out, you come out with two. You get return shots. Now, 20 numbers hit with just ones and twos, but you've also got the other numbers. You're, you're just a huge favorite to hit here, and most of the time you hit, you win. Uh, so there's no question about the double. I don't think I'm taking. And he passed to agree with me. All right, Goss is, uh, is really on a roll here. Won a lot of points in, in a row to catch up. And I don't see any real bad plays or blunders. I think it's, he's made good plays and he's had good dice. Not a bad combination. A lot of people say, oh, those better players, they always get better dice. They do. Better players get better dice. They, have, they put their checkers in a place where there are more rolls that can help them and fewer rolls that can really hurt them. That's what backgammon play is all about. So they're more likely to get a good roll and less likely to get a bad roll because they put themselves in better positions. So all these players go away crying. Oh, the, the, these bots, these online ga games are always helping the better player. Darn right they do, does because they deserve it. Well, I stack. I, I just I just stack. That's right. Well, no, that, okay. It's kind of a big play. You're outboarded, but I like it. I'm not sure I made that play. The more I look at it, the more I like it. <laughs> and if guys did it, there's a pretty good chance it's right. Cover. And... And uh, pick up your dice and hope the guy doesn't realize that you had a four left. Oh. Come on, guys. You're not listening to me. Six, three runs. Okay. We got the pure, typical 18-point holding game. I call it the midpoint standoff. A midpoint against a far point. Very, very 
typical kind of game. This is where I, my good friend and fellow teacher Grant Hoffman's theories come into play about when do you double these positions. Blue has a double in a money game or at normal scores when he has the root called the rule of four. When he has four or fewer checkers on the midpoint, a landing spot, and up 15% in the race. <coughs> well, he's not, he hasn't got any of those. Well, he's got a landing spot. He's got the eight point to land on. He's got five checkers on the midpoint, and I don't think he's up 15% in the race. And how do you figure the 15%? You count, you count Blue's race. Let's say he's got 100, and his opponent better have 115. 15% 15 of 100 would be 15 pips. Gaz is counting, being very methodical here. They really are both a little short on time for the amount of match that could be left. I think they've both taken a little more time than they need to in some plays and positions. And one of the reasons is they're both slow counters. They're both taking too hard to count. The better you get, the faster you need to count so you can spend more time on the more the thorough thoughts. And if a thorough is too big for anybody, I'm, I'm sorry to be condescending, but... Um, it means a little bit more flighty. <laughs> I have a I have a shirt uh, that says I'm uh, I don't want to be condescending. Uh, it says that that means uh, let me if if you need me to tell you what that means I will something like that. Oh, got dice goes over. He's winning the race, so you break the back point. If he wasn't winning the race, he would keep that point. And now, I'm not sure who's winning this race. It's got to be very close. <clears throat> very close. Just looking at the outfield, it's close. And the infield, by just comparison, a quick estimate. I know some players, some very good players, like Matt Kongair, is able to keep the pip count, exact pip count for both sides, in his head running the entire time. And there's other people that keep the difference running which is much easier, and I can often do that. Up 10, down 5, up 6, which is good enough because unless you're doubling, you don't need the exact pip count. You just need to know the difference. And by the way, once you count the pips, that's I always do that. Once I get a pip count, I always just add and subtract whatever's rolled so that I don't have to count again to save time on the clock and to save mental energy. You can see that this is a pretty close race. And you can see that Gaz maybe took a little lead here. His, his, his inner board is hurting in the pip count a little bit, but he's winning on the outer board. I like that unstacking there. He'll be punished if he rolls ones and twos, but he's likely to not. So I like the unstacking. Walter Trice often wrote about, he said, people say you got to get in to get off, so they bring all their checkers into the six point. So that's a very bad theory, and it doesn't work, and you'll lose if you if you stay with that theory. you got to get in to get off the gammon, but not, not, to get, uh, not to get to win the game. All right, very, very good roll, 12 pips and three checkers off. Again, you can see that it's close, but George has the edge. How often do you see a game go to the very end with nobody doubling? Very, very rarely. And I'm sure this won't either. Because if it usually only happens if the players are very bad players, once in a great while, will it be right to go to the end with, and both players are right not to have doubled? I would double here four roll versus one, two, three, four, five roll. Pip count 10, 20, 32, 33 for white, 10, 20, 30. 3841. <coughs> Got to be a pass. I think there's too many checkers and too many pips. Three away, five away. Pretty powerful recube, yet I agree with the pass. I agree with the double. I think the cube action was right the entire game. 
And now we have two away, five away. This is a very interesting score that people don't understand. The take point for Gaz is only 17%. It's very low because it really doesn't cost them much to lose one or two points. Your opponent still has to win two more games with the cube turned or one gammon with the cube turned. So give up the giving up an extra point by taking the cube doesn't cost much unless you're in a position where you could get gammoned. So his take point is pretty low. And your opponent's take point remains pretty much normal, around 22-23%. The big kicker is the gambit value. The cube, turn the cube to two, and Gaz has no value from winning a gammon, and George has pretty big value, about 0.8, because he gets to Crawford if he wins a gammon. The other thing is George should be a little bit quicker to double because he never has to worry about being redoubled. In a normal situation, remember I told you about that 18% edge you have in a race holding the cube? You don't have that if you can never recube. And in this position, Gaz is never going to recube if he gets the cube because he only needs two points. So as a result, even though the take point 70%, you can give the cube a little faster when you get closer to the 70%. For example, at 19 or 20% in a race. Probably right to double because there's no recube big, even though you know he has a take. And of course, if it's a gammonish position, that's a whole different story. And you're going to double much faster. Yeah. Ah, not a good roll. I come down and hit, though. And now I slot your bar point. I like this play. I don't see an alternative. Nice roll. Gaz is really. On a terror here, getting the right rolls and the right plays. And I'm sure George is just shaking his head saying, what can I do? What can I do? Just hope the, hope the dice gods decide to be fair. We'll find out if I'm right that George has been luckier because we can look at XG and it will tell you, after this put, match is put in the computer, it'll tell you the luck factor. I think... Clearly, the last several games, I haven't seen major play errors that caused guys to get this big a lead. I think it's luck. People ask me, how much is back M and luck? And my answer is, if you have two equal players, it's all luck. <clears throat> but you rarely have two equal players, and even two equal players have different skills and can push the game towards their strengths and their opponents' weaknesses. So even there, <coughs> they can somewhat minimize the luck factor. I love this play. Very aggressive. <coughs> Such an easy take. I wouldn't give the cube. Too easy a take. Yeah. If he just loses one point here and it's one away, five away, he still has about 16% chance to win the match. Why well, give him an easy cube to win the whole match now? And you'd like to wait, give your opponent a cube that he's sweating a little bit. Where he's not quite sure what to do. It's a pretty ugly roll. That's my play. Just leave him an ace. Off the bar and an ace. Ooh. Huh. Okay. Not real pretty either. The only safe play is to the two. You hope your opponent comes in high. Ooh, it's pretty high. That's pretty good. Now, if you were blue, would you take? That's my first question. I'm sure Gaz is asking that question. Woolsey's Law is pretty universal. Players all over the world have been using that theory for a long, long time. And the score is the only thing that stops you from doubling here. And because he rolled a three, he's very happy he didn't double here. Threes are his worst number, obviously. Everything else plays. And he rolled it. But it's not the end of the world. Not the way that George has been rolling. 
I come off the bar and play safe. Okay. Wow. Now do you take, if 16% is your equity if you pass, you can take a recube, but you don't win the match. So that means 16% is not your take point. Your take point is still somewhat higher. That's a great roll. <clears throat> he should play on here. Hope he gets a gammon. And he is. He could easily win the gammon now for the match. That's why he didn't double. If he doubled, then George would have passed, and he would have only won a point. Now he could still win the match, and there's no way he's going to lose, so why not give it a trot? Good roll. High numbers are very important here. All right, the two comes in, the three comes across. I would move it from either one of them is fine. Get a crossover, get it in range. Looks like a probable game, but unless he gets really lucky, I just bring it in the most efficient way. No wastage to play into the six point. What he did with two crossovers doesn't hurt, though. Looking pretty dim for George. Please hit the like button. Please visit Backgammon Galaxy. Look at their beautiful Backgammon products. And come back at uh, tonight at uh, 10 p.m. to see the finals of the undefeated. They shake hands. Good sportsmanship. Well-played match. I'm going to see if I can get guys to come over and say a few words. If I had a microphone. <clears throat> I think I could go live on this one, yes? Uh, we're out we're live streaming, George. I wanna I wanna congratulate you for getting this far. It was a very good tournament. Even though you lost, I thought uh guys were gonna come over for a second. And I, yeah, have a seat, uh pull over. And yeah. well, I'd like to talk to both of you a little bit. So, uh, I thought I saw a very solid play uh, and a very good, strong match. And um, I, I might be off off a little bit by saying this, but for the last five games, I didn't see anything but good play from both of you. And I saw probably the luck factor favoring uh, guys quite a bit. The last five games, I didn't see any bad rolls for you. Pretty pretty yeah, much, and well, it, it just yeah. just came home. Well time break. Uh, any other thoughts? You take a break and then you come uh, back and your dice change. Well, it's it's smart to take a break. You were getting beaten, I was, yeah, beaten yeah. and clobbered at the beginning. Uh, I the funniest thing is I I sit and say what I would do. Uh, guys and I had the same play almost every time. You and I had some disagreements, which proves how much better you are than me. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Uh, so. Uh, this was the money round, so congratulations. You're in the money, guys. Uh, and uh, your next, uh, by the way, let's see what the update is. You're going to be playing. It's hard to say who you're going to play. Oh, that's right. You're in the, you're in the fighter's bracket. The, yeah, so we the, don't know who you're playing, do the we? The winner of Lawrence and Ruben. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Lawrence is from the UK as well. 10-6. Lawrence yeah, is leading? So I'm hoping to play Lawrence. Yeah, I never uh, never let Ronnie uh, uh, out of the game. He, he does very well in Monte Carlo. Ryan's yeah. a good friend of mine. I know his game well. He's a great bridge player. He's one he of the won great. Cyprus a few years ago, I think. Hmm? Didn't he win Cyprus a few years ago? He won Cyprus a few years ago, and he won the the Monte Carlo Open here a couple of few years ago too. And he, he just always he's just very tough. He doesn't play a lot of backgammon. He plays mostly bridge. Uh huh. But he's very sharp. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to yeah, see yeah, you. Sure. And I'm going to see you in Athens next week. Sure. Let's get together. Can I
Hmm? Can I rent something and play some backgammon? We'll play some backgammon by the sea, eh? We'll play by the sea. By the way, I'm bringing several. A bunch of my friends will be with me. All backgammon players. We'll have some fun. Okay, I have, I have my backgammon board. I'm okay, ready for you. I'm ready for you too. Congratulations to both of you on Thank a great you. match. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Good luck. Good luck going forward. Cheers. Did anyone transcribe? Were there any PLs? Uh, uh, nobody was doing it, uh, doing it as we I'm go. The other <laughs> It'll get there. No, we had quite a few watchers. We're doing. You're very popular, both of you. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see you all tonight at. Oh, I'll give you a quick update. Uh, Zednik leads Wilcox, twelve to five, twelve to seven. Now, Sander leads Benjamin Lund nine to four. Still, I guess it hasn't been updated. Uh, but. Uh, those are for the leaders bracket. Uh, we'll have some really great matches tonight. Of course, it will be the finals of the undefeated, which is not the finals of the of the tournament. And uh, thank you so much for watching. Hit the like button, and uh, we'll see you soon. Really appreciate your participation. And bye, everybody. I'll see you tonight. See you at ten o'clock.